Oh, hi boys and girls. Today, we're talking about clowns. Can you say clowns? I bet you can. Now say it again. Now say it again. We're talking about 10 movies with evil clowns in them, but there's so many more out there. So if you don't see the one that you are thinking of, turn around. It's probably right behind you. Number 10. First up, we're gonna talk about 2021's Clowns in the Woods, which starts off with a bunch of bullies, and one has a big evil clown tattooed on his arm, and oh, uh, bo both arms, but these characters are supposed to be the popular jocks, and I have to confess that I don't know many frat type bros with uh, multiple evil clown tattoos. There's also Marcus here who is bullied by the jocks and he gets a mysterious book about clowns. Then Brad's girlfriend shows up to say that they broke up and invites him to her place and he agrees to go because he's never seen the Toxic Avenger, I guess. To make this more familiar, she tricks him into kissing an animal as they all laugh at him and he runs out, but not into a vat of toxic waste, but into the street where he's hit by a car. I'm not sure how serious we're supposed to take this. this hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that responding to Anoki? And his spirit meets a group of clowns in the woods because they're in the title. Soon, Marcus is showing up in full clown gear to get revenge, and they need the book back, but Marcus's brother has taken it. And in case you thought the Toxie similarity was coincidental, there's a signed Toxic Crusader card here. They continue their vengeance ploy and travel via magic tent, and it turns out that several of them are from the 1940s, and eventually they cross the line, putting innocents in danger in order to retrieve their book. Interesting aspect here is that the main character is meant to be mentally handicapped and so is his best friend and one of the writers slash directors is actually autistic himself and it was made for around $35,000 and it's not unwatchable but it could certainly stand to either ramp up the seriousness or the silliness, one of the two because there's funny, there's funny things in here like things were definitely intended to be jokes, like the clown keeping a knife under his man boob, but a good portion of it seems to take itself uh, uh, pretty seriously. Ultimately, I don't mind this one, but I'm not sure it gets a recommend. Uh, plus, the clown cringe factor is pretty high here. I'm giving it a seven. It also features probably one of the most head-scratchingly terrible ending credit songs that I have ever heard. We're here to help, to right the wrong, to make them right. Don't worry, we're your friends now, we're your friends now. We're here to help, to right the wrong, to make them right. Don't worry, we're your friends now, we're your friends now. We're here to help. Number nine. Next up is 2021's Behind the Sightings, which cashed in on the rash of odd clown sightings across the US that happened a few years back, which was actually a real thing that got addressed by the White House. That's how widespread it was. And the press briefing is actually included here. Funny thing is that a lot of the hubbub can be traced back to a viral marketing campaign for a movie. We'll get to that. But here, another film tries to get behind it, showing what is purported to be actual footage of people being attacked and killed by people in clown outfits. There's more than one of them, and we're set up to think that we're watching recovered footage, and oh yes, it's found footage. We meet Todd and Jessica here, and here's, I guess, something interesting. They're the only listed cast on the IMDb. Like, they're the only credited actors, which is kind of funny because there's clearly other people in this movie. There's other actors in all the other videos from the beginning of the film, and there's the people playing the clowns. So uh, none of them wished to take credit for being in this movie or they're just really dedicated to keeping the illusion that this is real events and, and and like first of all no one's falling for that in this day and age guys we know 
the score. And secondly, the actors aren't really that bad. Like, they're not terrible, but it's also very clear that they're acting. There's the standard interview with an expert who tells us that there's ooh, e evil clowns out there, which are different than creepy clowns, I guess. It, you, you've got to sort of, have you ever heard the expression, never get on the, the bad side of a clown? No, I never have heard of that because no one has ever said that before. You did right now. I, I Googled it, no results. And here's another found footage trope that I think is hilarious. Why do they always go to some expert and that expert always ends up freaking out and stopping the interview or leaving the house? Like, like they're just asking about clowns, dude. The guy here is probably one of the most grating and hateable characters in a horror movie that I have seen in a while. Today. Wake up. Wake up! <laughs> have you ever heard of the term clown lives matter? The term what clown life? Are you serious right now? I'm dead serious. And some random guy tells them where there's apparently just always clowns, which I love, like I love. Like, like there's just this clown hangout area and this guy's been like sitting on this information. Uh, turns out that that dude was right though. And there's um, a clown dancing with glow sticks. So I guess, sure, go, go right up to him, I, I guess. Of course, things start to get out of control and they start stalking our couple. And when the clowns invite them to a farmhouse, they uh, go. They don't tell anyone, don't bring any sort of backup, no nothing. They just stroll right in and you could probably figure out where it goes from here. And yep, I hate this. It's everything about found footage that doesn't work for me and every single set of circumstances in this film are only arrived at because the main characters are complete and total idiots. The clown cringe factor is medium here, like, like a six, because they don't say anything, but they certainly try too hard to act creepy, especially in this one convenience store scene. And, and, and I tell you, if I didn't already commit to this clown thing, I would quit right here. Number eight. Okay, let's move on to 2004's Fear of Clowns, which was written and directed by Kevin Kangas. And there's some murders in Lynn's neighborhood, and then this deep discount, Bruce Campbell, is on the case. Lynn does a series of clown paintings, and she has an ex-husband that she's having issues with, and there's also a man in clown makeup with no shirt or pupils hanging around outside her house. The cops arrive. Yes, there was someone standing at my back door when I turned on the light. Was he black or white? Um, does this guy only know of two ethnicities? I mean, he does know that there are more, right? Have you ever been spanked by a clown, Miss Blodgett? Wait, wait. What is this movie? So this guy gives her 20,000 bucks to paint his dad who was a clown and Shivers here is getting instructions on coming after Lynn and they go through the Enchanted Forest, which is a real theme park in Maryland that was abandoned. And you see it here in 2004, completely run down, but it was restored and reopened and is currently back to full operation. Her new boyfriend seems to have some secrets and her husband has hired a guy to follow her. And it's not the clown, but but he's a former patient of the doctor and just starts killing whoever. And oh boy, that clown cringe factor is a full on nine here. Look at this guy. This is barely a clown and more of a thunder down under kind of thing. Like they were just sitting there writing this and we're like, well, our clown is mostly nipple. And here's the deal. This isn't terrible. I mean, it's, it's bad, but I like that they tried to do some character stuff and make their cast feel like real people, but it just takes itself way too seriously. It is pretty technically inept. 
It ends pretty simply and fairly anticlimactically, but then just closes on a cliffhanger. But it turns out that there is a sequel made three years later with 2007's Fear of Clowns 2, again written and directed by Kangas. It has the return of Detective Peters, who is diagnosed with a fatal disease, but then it picks up where the last one left off, but Shivers now has an accomplice. But clearly, the cliffhanger bit was just Lynn's dream, and it's said to be two years after the first movie. She now has a book about it, and oh, Shivers now has two other clowns that have joined him. They kill off the love interest from the first film off screen, and this one has less of a plot than the first one. This is pretty much just the trio of clowns trying to find and kill Lynn, and it's an hour and 40 minutes long, but yeah, feels much longer. Uh, I guess it sort of feels more like a classic slasher flick by the end of it, but overall it's pretty dull, and even ends on another cliffhanger, but there were no more follow-ups. Cringiness is pretty strong here. I'm going with an 8 mainly due to Shiver's over-exaggerated line readings and that ridiculous getup. <laughs> Number 7. So far I have picked some duds, so let's have some higher hopes for 2017's Clowntergeist. And did I really just say that uh, out loud? Well, this was written and directed by Aaron Mirtis, I think who also did Curse of the Nun, which I covered in my Conjuring ripoff video, and that, that had some good stuff going for it, so maybe my hopes are medium high. The Evil Doctor from Mermaid Down is here, and I liked that movie too, so at least there's some things looking up, and we see this young woman attacked by a clown. We then have a couple of college roommates, including Emma and Heather, and Emma hates clowns, like to the point where if she sees a cartoon clown on an ice cream wrapper, she makes a face. <laughs> Soon, the girl from the beginning, as well as Emma, are being bothered by red balloons. And oh yeah, this coincidentally came out in 2017, the same year as the IT remake. She starts seeing the clown, and there are some legitimately effective moments. And there's yet another bald-faced reproduction of the classic Exorcist 3 hallway scene. I swear I've seen like four of them recently. This clown's name is Ribcage, and I guess his methodology is picking a victim and giving them a time that he'll attack them, and then frightens them beforehand, and he's, I guess, possessed, but there wasn't an exorcism, so he's still technically human, but has demonic powers, so his body can be killed. Our first full-on view of Ribcage is, well, not too impressive. I'm, I'm glad they didn't go full on with the, oh look, aren't clowns creepy and scary when you make them look specifically creepy and scary. So he looks more like a real clown, but considering this instant is supposed to be an evil supernatural clown, maybe it could have used a, like, a, like a bit more of that. And sadly, the innovation and sense of suspenseful styling seems to kind of die off by the halfway point, and it starts to feel a little bit more like any standard movie, although it kind of tries to get things back on track in the final act, but is still missing that cool atmosphere it set up earlier. Clown cringe is lower here, but still there, and I'm giving it a four, since there's some genuinely creepy moments, but then this costume is just from a bag. And I don't know what's up with this contorted positioning. It takes away all the spookier elements of Ribcage and just makes him look kinda silly. I don't know, uh, check it out if you'd like, because it's not terrible. I mean, I thought it was pretty watchable and enjoyable, but I'll, but I'll, stop, I'll stop before saying that I liked it. Number 6. Killer Clowns from Outer Space had, well, uh, clowns from outer space, and that was great, so why not try again with 2016's Space Clown? It's the directorial debut of actor Graham Skipper, who has been in quite a few horror movies and also made the Shutter film Sequence Break. Oh, it also has a title track. Space Clown! The premise here is that Graham has a new video camera, and he tries to film a meteor shower at night, but instead captures something weird, and then later passes out. His friend stops by and is attacked and tied up by the space clown, who says that he is now stranded here and needs fuel for his escape pod in the form of people. 
There's the unparalleled comedy of SC pooping with silly sound effects. And he keeps recording, although occasionally there's stuff that seems unnecessary to be filming. Like why is he filming himself laying in bed, talking on the phone? He films evidence of the clown, but the footage seems to wipe itself right after, which is weird because the beginning of the film told us that we're watching his recovered footage. So did it like restore itself? His girlfriend is taken over by space clown and he's kidnapped, uh, setting up some top notch humor. Oh, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> and I do not know what I am watching or why I have chosen to watch it. This feels like something some bored actors threw together during the pandemic to alleviate their boredom, but this was in 2016, so that's not an excuse, I guess. There's really nothing to it, and it doesn't even really hold up to its own premise of uh, being some sort of found footage at times. But yeah, I didn't care for it. The, the clown cringe factor here is high at a solid seven because absolutely none of the humor lands. None, none of it, not a single joke. And, and I feel like he's really trying, but it's just not my kind of comedy, I suppose. At least he looks all right. It, it's a balance of cheap and trying to be spooky. That's fine, I, I guess. Number five. For this one, let's go back to 2007 for the slightly infamous drive through It gives us some killer clown action right away inside this fast food restaurant, and he's the place's mascot. So he has a drive through speaker for a mouth, and, and ugh, I guess his name is Horny the Clown. Leighton Meester is here, and this seems like the kind of movie that shows up very early on in an actor's resume, but she had already been on a bunch of TV shows before this, and it was right before her being on Gossip Girl. Her and her friends mess with a Luigi board and get some reactions, and oh hey, her mom is Jan Levinson. We know the clown is supernatural because he starts talking to Mackenzie through an eight ball. Is it fly? Oh, girlfriend, it's super fly, TNT. Listen, I got a jam. Oh yes, this is how the kids talk, isn't it? Roach is in this too, and Horny starts stalking and killing her friends, but no one believes that a clown did it. And what's frustrating is that despite the title, I'm almost halfway through the film, and the only connection to a fast food restaurant or a drive through was the opening scene. Most of it has just been guy in a clown suit stalking in suburbia. It turns out that the parents of all the victims appear to be linked, and they do get back to the fast food place at around the hour mark. And, and there's a cameo from Morgan Spurlock when he was just basically the anti-McDonald's guy. And they portray the pothead trio as causing a ruckus and throwing things around in the kid zone, which is like, have they actually met any potheads? Turns out there's a dirty secret linking everyone, Kruger style, and Horny is saving Mac for last. And I guess what's under his mask has pretty profound effects. And uh, sp speaking of effects, what, uh, what the hell is this? And this isn't bad. It, it feels more legitimate than quite a few others here and has the flavor of a throwback horror film, but sadly it's not really enough. It, it's made too late to be a part of the 80s slasher stuff and also missed out on the 90s resurgence and came out in that whole Saw slash Hostel era where a movie like this just felt kind of cliche and it mostly is. There's really nothing surprising at any point here, but it's enjoyable enough. The, the clown cringe is pretty low too because even though there's bad one-liners, they feel more wannabe Freddy style and somebody making an effort to be clowny. Uh, the, the look of Horny is all right as well. I mean, he's a ghost demon clown, so he should look like it, right? Number four. Let's class this up a bit with 1999's The Clown at Midnight, which was directed by Jean Pellerin, mostly known for heavy metal music videos. It starts behind the scenes of a performance of Pagliacci, and she's attacked by someone in a clown uniform and murdered. 
Years later, Kate here discovers that she was adopted and that Lorraine was her birth mother, and she becomes a part of a group looking to restore the theater in which she died, including Frank the Bunny and Ashley Banks, under the tutelage of the one and only Lois Lane. Then, for extra cred, Christopher Plummer strolls in as well, and he says that Lorraine's killer was suspected to be the actor who played Pagliacchi in her opera, and he vanished after her death and is still out there somewhere, but it seems like he's up to something sinister himself. George here acts a bit suspicious himself, and this guy finds a big pool of blood on the ground, and his first instinct is to lay down on it. He freaks out when it turns out to still be fresh, but come on man, even if it were dried out from years ago, you're still just laying down on a pool of blood. Kate finds out that the man who was accused of the killing may be her real dad, and at one point there's a really awkward editing decision made to have one couple getting ready to do it with the audio of the other couple sword fighting, and it is just really confusing. But soon, Pagliacci is back, killing again, and given the 1999 release date, you can really feel the scream influence in this one, and it has that whole bunch of pretty people, including some name recognition, getting bumped off while you try to figure out who's really responsible vibe going on. There's some red herrings thrown around, and it's pretty enjoyable, and, and I'm gonna spoil this a bit because there's a turn of events that's really silly here. Kate is confronted by Orsini, the man who may or may not be her father, but it turns out that he's not the killer, and Plummer was all along. But what the hell was Orsini doing in the clown makeup? He says he's been hiding out there ever since the murder, but was in the makeup the entire time? It's pretty ridiculous, but the movie's pretty enjoyable, although a little slow. There's very little cringe, though. It, it, it's a good look, and he doesn't act silly or anything. It, it's, pretty, it's pretty effective. Number three. Okay, uh, Clownado. Why not? This gem is from 2019 and was directed by Todd Sheets, creator of the Zombie Bloodbath trilogy, and starts with a bunch of circus folk who talk like they learned English from noir detective stories. You're used good, toots. It's how used I didn't know till now. And you, no talent, deadbeat. And after Big Ronnie's wife tries to double cross him, he dons clown gear and tortures her as part of the show. Savannah decides to get revenge and enlists a witch, and they cast a spell of vengeance. It kind of goes out of control, having an effect on the clown crew, and there's then a strip club run by Trash, and her character name here is Spider, which was Linnea's name in Sorority Babes and the Slime Bowl, Bola Rama, so I guess it's possible that she's playing the same character here. Turns out that Ronnie and his gang are back getting revenge on the witch. We then get an assortment of colorful characters, a redneck trucker, a black Elvis impersonator, a stripper, teen runaway, and then they all end up at a diner with Savannah as a tornado rolls in. Oh, sorry, did I say tornado? I meant clownado. They attack the diner, killing everyone they come across in a variety of over-the-top manners, including, surprisingly, Savannah. The female clown has boobs that turn into mouths that eat people, and Savannah ends up being less dead than expected, and she goes a little off the deep end, and our heroes realize that they have to stop the tornado in order to stop the clowns. And this, this is a blast. This is exactly what I want when I watch a silly backyard low budget movie. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it also doesn't treat itself like a joke. It's really fun, and yes, of course, it's not good. It's not a good movie in the traditional sense of the word, but it's the precise type of good that I enjoy with these kind of things. Although, they do essentially just take the ending of Sharknado, what with essentially just dropping a bomb into the tornado itself. So, so yeah, top-notch trash. And in terms of clown cringe, it's low, like, like a two, and that's because the tone of the movie is just right for how they act, so you're not rolling your eyes at it. TCB, baby! Well... Number two. 
Next up is 2018's Gags the Clown, which starts off with our creepy dude appearing and attacking some people, and we get news footage about a bunch of clown sightings. And remember earlier when I was talking about the real life sightings and how they turned out to be a viral marketing campaign for a movie? Well, it was this one. This, sort of. It was for a short film called Gags the Clown from 2016 that they got some notoriety from and then expanded that into a feature version, which is what this is. Gags shows up around town creating a tizzy and it's sort of found footage. I mean, it's, it's from an assortment of different characters and different perspectives and including a couple of police officers who remembered to have their body cams on for once, a news crew reporting on the sightings, and a loudmouth radio show guy, as well as a bunch of kids at a party. Turns out the Gags is possibly the same clown from an incident back in 1974 where there was a tragic fire, and he seems to have some sort of sway on some people, but interestingly enough, it keeps Gags himself off camera for a good duration of the film. A large portion of it is more about the effect that his appearances have on the people and the hysteria that it brings with him on the loose. But thankfully, large groups of people don't just start randomly chanting, evil dies tonight. People all over are being affected and it seems to be insinuated that it's the substance in the balloons that's affecting people and may just be full of bath salts, but there's also the implication that there's something supernatural going on. And this is just, just like almost pretty solid. It, it actually does a really good job conveying a sense of scale and atmosphere and there's a nice sense of mystery around what's going on. But it's hampered by an assortment of unconvincing actors and poor staging choices. Some of the found footage aspects just don't, just don't work. Like people just constantly standing perfectly still in front of each other's body cams in order to have a conversation. And plenty of instances of um, why are they filming this right now? I, I feel like this actually would have been better if it were filmed without the whole found footage aspects and just, just done in a traditional narrative sense so they didn't constantly have to sort of justify things with like, oh, oh hey, we're having a simple conversation here, might as well film it. Or, well, I, I just so happened to park directly under a security camera, perfectly centered. It does all come to a pretty solid conclusion, although again, one that suffers from the filming choices, and I have to say that the cringe aspect is a zero, since Gags is actually genuinely creepy and doesn't try to act all silly. It's handled really well. Number one. We'll wrap this up with 2014's Clown by John Watts. Yes, that John Watts, before he made the current number three grossing film of all time, he made a monster clown movie. And when I sat down to figure out which movies to include on this list, it was the first one I wrote down. So this has Kent here, whose kid is having a birthday party, and their clown cancels, so he has to improvise and finds this old clown outfit in the basement of a house he's selling in order to save the day. After the party, he accidentally falls asleep in the outfit, and it turns out that he's unable to get the suit off. Like, he's not even able to cut it off. When they try to pull off the nose, it takes a chunk of his skin, and the wig becomes his hair. He continues to change and starts to uncover the secrets behind the suit from a nihilist, and learns that the suit is the skin of a demon called the Cloyne. Looks like the only way to stop it is decapitation. And you know, th this film had a really interesting genesis. Watts and the film's co-writer, Christopher Ford, made a fake trailer for a script they had, and it rather boldly stated that it was produced by Eli Roth, even though Roth was not involved whatsoever. Roth was actually amused by the audacity and thought that the concept was interesting, so he did get involved and did become a producer, helping the film get made. Ken's transformation gets worse and he starts to get hungry whenever little kids are around and he's unable to commit suicide. But it turns out that there's a way to reverse the change, although it's a price that may be a little too high to pay. This is a pretty great flick that does unfortunately hit a bit in the middle in which it doesn't really seem to know what to do with itself, but beyond that, it's worth checking out. There's a certain element of it that feels like the fly, and given the premise, I'm sure there was potential to go goofy with it, but it's treated very seriously. Like the, like the cringe factor is a total zero, the 
Clown is great and spooky, it works 100% and it's fantastic. So there you have it, it's 10 movies about evil clowns in one way or another. Um, yeah, there's so, so many freaking killer clown movies out there, lots of them. Um, so I'm sure I'll cover more of these in the future in a sequel to this. Uh, let me know which one of those you want to see in a follow-up video. Uh, let me know if there's other clown movies that you're curious about. I'm sure I have them on a list somewhere, but let me know which ones you want to see. And tell me what you thought of these ones. Put that down in the comments down below. If you got a kick out of this, hit the like button. If you like what you see on the channel, hit the subscribe button. And if you want to go check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines, like these guys over here do, I would appreciate that. They, they, they help me buy uh, stupid things like this to wear. And so I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. I guess I can t take this up. We... We, we may have a problem.